Well, good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome you to Westminster Presbyterian Church this morning. And if you're new or visiting, we do have some welcome gift bags out in the narthex on the table. So we uh, encourage you to take one uh, just as a gift uh, from us to you on behalf of worshiping with us. We do have a couple of announcements. The ladies' uh, lunch, where uh, they all get together on Wednesdays, is happening this Wednesday, and there's more information on it in the bulletin, but just a reminder about that. For our middle school girls, we have a coffee date tomorrow, and so I believe there was just a slide up there, and now I'm just forgetting what time it was. So uh, 9 o'clock, be here at the church, and then we'll go out for some coffee and just catch up on the summer. Uh, Our 4th of July ice cream social was fantastic, so thank you for everyone who came out, helped set up, helped scoop ice cream and everything. I believe we had about 500 people served, so uh, 15 gallons of ice cream, I believe, and a nice big uh, keg of root beer, and it was just an awesome time uh, to get together and outreach for our community. Otherwise, just check out the bulletin. We do have uh, office volunteers needed if you'd like to volunteer, help answer phones for a couple hours, as well as the food pantry continues to need to be stocked. And so if you're willing, you can bring in food for the food pantry. And so now let us get ready to worship our God in spirit and in truth. And we can stand for our opening hymns, Blessed Assurance, number 426, and Refiner's Fire, number 374.
Let us pray. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day. And thank you for those gathering here today in person and online. May we all open our minds to follow your desire and your plan for us to become more like your Son, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Our Old Testament scripture this morning is found in the book of Daniel and can be found on page 833, Daniel 11, 36 through 39, on page 833. The king shall act as he pleases. He shall exalt himself and consider himself greater than any god, and shall speak horrendous things against the god of gods. He shall prosper until the period of wrath is completed. For what is determined shall be done. He shall pay no respect to the gods of his ancestors or to the one beloved by women. He shall pay no respect to any other god, for he shall consider himself greater than all. He shall honor the god of fortresses instead of these, a god whom his ancestors did not know, he shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. He shall deal with the strongest fortresses by the help of a foreign god. Those who acknowledge him, he shall make more wealthy, and shall appoint them as rulers over many, and shall distribute the land for a price. Well, we do thank Sue Radloff and Esther Barati for sharing with us their beautiful uh, cello music this morning, as well as Cindy Jays for helping to lead us in the hymns. 
And so we do come before God this morning with our prayers and praise. I do encourage you to turn to the prayer and praise portion of your bulletin as we lift up to God this morning our prayers. We do have a couple to add. Uh, Eileen Lisney wanted to share that her daughter-in-law, Sarah, is in the hospital dealing with some medical issues, so we will continue to pray for her. And then an update on her son-in-law, Rodney, who is also continuing to struggle with pneumonia after a double lung transplant. So we will keep them in our prayers. And we do have some sad news. We like to lift up the family of George Moore, who passed away last night. And so we do continue to pray for his son, Michael, and daughter-in-law, Denise. But are there any other prayers we can lift up to our God this morning? Yes, Kay. And you said this is Darlene? Arlene. Arlene. So Arlene's second son, Matt, passed away, and we'd like to keep the family in prayers. All right. Well, let us go before our God in prayer. Gracious and merciful God, we just thank you for the gift of this day for the gift of your presence and your love as we come to worship you and to praise you for all that you are. And God, we just ask that your presence be felt by all who are here today. Help us as we come and hear your word. And God, just help us to be faithful in loving you. And God, we know you are a God that hears and cares about our prayers. So we ask that you hear us now in this time of silent meditation. So God, we do thank you for hearing our prayers. And we'd like to lift up to you Pastor Mike Olmsted's father, Don, who's continuing to struggle with medical issues. And God, we just ask for healing for him, give him strength. God, we lift up to you Renee Harnick, who is recovering after a car accident. God, we ask that the healing is quick and that she is not in any pain. We lift up to you Dolores and Vali's sister, Elsa who had a hemorrhaged stroke with a brain bleed, and God, we ask for healing for her as well. Help her to continue to gain strength. God, we lift up to you Jan Huskin, who has upcoming meetings and consultations on surgery on her back this week. God, we ask that this goes smoothly and that you just guide the doctors in their assessment and in their uh, surgery. God, we lift up to you, Serene and Jack, who are both recovering from surgeries, and we thank you that they went well, and God, we just ask for healing for them as well. And we continue to pray for Rodney, who is dealing with pneumonia after a double lung transplant. God, we thank you that the surgery did go smoothly, but we do ask for continued healing as he is trying to uh, get better, and God, we just ask that you give him strength. We lift up to you, Joanne Fox, who has been diagnosed with colon cancer. And God, we ask that healing can happen as well with her. And God, we also lift up to you, Sarah Lisney, who's in the hospital struggling. And God, ask for healing in her life. And God, we do lift up to you those who have lost loved ones. For Arlene, who has lost her second son, Matt. And God, we also lift up to you the family of George Moore. And God, we just pray for them during this time of grief, that you surround them with your joy and you comfort them, letting them know that their loved ones are with you and at peace. And God, we do come to you with our praises as well, and we thank you that uh, Keith King received good news, that he does not have Parkinson's, but just a nerve infringement, which can be uh, treated. And so God, we just thank you for that, that good news. And so, God, we do ask that you hear us now as we pray the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And although during the summer months we do not have ushers come around and collect an offering, we do have offering plates in the back if you feel led to give. And so we do ask God that you use all these gifts for your kingdom purposes, sharing your love with the world, and just sharing these blessings. Amen.
now let us remain standing and turn to our neighbors and greet each other with the peace of Christ. And as you all return to your seats, I'd like to invite all the children forward. You can come on up because Callie has a children's sermon ready for you. So. Hey guys. So I gotta get my notes out. Do you guys know what a goat is? What is it? Um, I'm talking about a different goat than an animal. Um, a goat is someone who is the greatest of all time in what they do. Some examples would be Michael Jordan, Garth Brooks, Barbara, Barbara Streisand. Oh wait, sorry, wrong crowd. <sighs> so your goats may be Jojo from Cocomelon, Blippi, Miss Rachel, Mario and Luigi, those are more appropriate for your generation. But for my generation, we think of influencers, actors, and of course, Taylor Swift. But I really don't want you guys to forget about the very first goat who we should never put below anyone else. He always put others before himself, and he never took his fame for granted, and he died on the cross to save everyone, any, everyone from our sins. Who am I talking about? That's right. Jesus Christ. That means that 2,023 years later, we are still being saved. Not one of those people that I named in the beginning can say that they have done that for that long. Even if we go back to old presidents, that's only hundreds of years, not thousands. That's why we need to know that Jesus Christ is the true goat. Will you guys pray with me? Dear Jesus, thank you for being our goat, our savior, and our hope. You continue to save us every day and inspire us to be our best selves. We love you and praise you. Amen. Now you guys can go join Miss Anne in the back for Sunshine Singers if you're three years old to second grade. Or go back to your parents. Well, thank you, Callie, for sharing with us the children's sermon this morning. Uh, who here has heard of that term goat before? Because I didn't know about it till uh, quite recently, so... But it's always good to learn something new. And Jesus, Jesus is, of course, the greatest of all time. And so I encourage you now, if you want to follow along for our New Testament lesson, it is found on page 239 of your New Testament Pew Bibles. And it comes from 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 through 27. So it's chapter 2. 18 through 27 of 1 John. Children, it is the last hour, as you have heard that Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But by going out, they made it plain that none of them belongs to us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and all of you have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and you know that no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist the one who denies the Father and the Son. The one who denies the Son has the Father. Everyone who confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, 
then you will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he has promised us, eternal life. I write these things to you concerning those who would deceive you. As for you, the anointing that you received from him abides in you, and so you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, abide in him. And so we do thank God for his word. Well, this morning we continue our series on 1 John. And in the beginning of the letter, John raised ideas about the way we express and live out our faith. And this was to encourage examination on our part, because it is healthy to reflect on how we act and what we say, to see if our words and actions are matching up with what we believe about Christ. So do our actions and do our words consist of Christ-like love and devotion, or do they represent something else? Now, John's letter takes us on a progression that deals with moral, social, and now doctrinal concerns. He began by having us reflect on our obedience to God's commands, on living as children of the light, about acknowledging wrongdoing and the nature of loving our siblings in Christ. And presumably, he brings all these things to the forefront because there were people that were not behaving in this manner. There were those who were in denial about the way they lived. There were those that didn't truly follow the commandments and those who were still living in darkness. So now in the portion we read today, John is turning the discussion to doctrinal belief. Essentially, he asked the question, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? And this might seem like a no-brainer to us, but it was an issue that the early church was dealing with. And John's main takeaway is, if you do not believe Jesus is the Son of God, you are denying God and not truly a Christian. John is warning the recipients of this letter in order to help them prepare themselves to stay strong in Christ. And John offers three pieces of advice to help combat this challenge. The first is to recognize the time that they live in. The second is to be aware of adversaries. And the third is to rely on the Holy Spirit. So John's first warning is to recognize the time we live in. He describes it as the last hour, which I don't know about you, but can seem very apocalyptic. And often we tend to ruminate on these words, the last hour, and fret and wonder when the end will come. John's usage of the last hour reminds me of a local priest and pastor who tried to warn motorists of needing to change their course. And so they stood by the side of the road, holding up a sign that said, the end is near. Turn yourselves around before it is too late. And they held up this sign to each passing car. And the first car that drives by yelled out the window, Leave us alone, you religious nuts. And from around the curve, they heard brakes screeching and a splash of water. And the pastor said, do you think we should have put on the sign that the bridge is out instead? (laughs) So like these motorists who were warned by the priest and pastor, John is trying to tell us something important. Often when we read these words, the last hour or the last days, we may become frightened or confused or indifferent and we'll latch on to these ideas of apocalyptic visions 
and the end of days as a scare tactic. We must realize, though, that instead of describing a duration of time, he is describing a kind of time. And so too often we'll latch on to that idea of duration, which will lead people to constant predictions about when the coming of Christ will happen, among other things. But we know that Christ has told us we don't know when that time is. So it seems silly to try and pinpoint that time. But understanding it as a kind of time will help us understand that it's a kind of time when people will deny Christ, a kind of time when people will try to replace Christ. And each generation is presented with their own unique challenges. In John's day, the church was still in its early formation. They had endured times of persecution from the Roman government, who saw them as this new rebellious group. They faced persecution from Jewish leaders, who viewed them as a threat to the traditional way of the way they taught. And these new Christians were opting to leave the Jewish understanding to follow Christ's teaching. And although many were following the teachings of Christ, John was aware of the schisms that were present. There were alternative beliefs which went against the main principles of Christianity, that Jesus is the Son of God. And this caused fractures within the newly establishing community. A few weeks ago, we heard Mike talk briefly about those different ideas of Gnosticism and Docetism, competing theologies of people who maybe believed that Christ couldn't be fully human or fully divine or both at the same time. So the time they were living in was the time of the newly fledging church where they were trying to establish the truth of Christ. And we too must be aware of the kind of time we live in. While the church in many ways is more established, we are faced with schisms of our own, as well as competing ideologies. For we live in an age of growing secularism, apathy, and nihilism. We have begun to disassociate with the idea of needing community, through asserting more independence and autonomy. A society where people increasingly don't see the need for God or a community of God or community at all sometimes. Where other things become more important, such as wealth and fame. And in John's time, people could have strove for such things. Now we are told that we can do anything and so we do. And it seems as though our society has set very few limits, creating a kind of frenzied free-for-all. We've lost the importance of faith and belief. And in doing so, we have created idols of celebrities and other prominent figures in a way that seems to replace Christ. Now, our passage, if you noticed, used the word antichrist a few times in both the big A antichrist and little a antichrist. Now, I think this word causes a lot of friction because of how it gets interpreted and portrayed. But we must look at it linguistically. And you know, I love words, I love studying languages, so I looked at the Greek of this. And that preposition, anti, can mean a few different things. It can mean to be against something, but it can also mean to be in place of something. So when we see the word antichrist brought up in this passage, we can understand it as those who flat out deny Christ, who oppose him, but we can also see them as people who put things or other people in Christ's place, whether it be celebrities, or the emperor for thinking about the Roman times. And we have to be aware of what might be taking Christ's place 
in our own lives. And so John's second warning is of adversaries. He names the main characteristics of these adversaries, those that deny Christ altogether. And what's interesting is that these adversaries aren't necessarily people outside of the church. John realized and saw that there were even people within the church who were denying Christ. And he is aware of the problem that this can create because we might be more apt to believe people within our church community than those outside of it. And I like to think of it as a wolf in sheep's clothing. And we've all heard of that phrase. And so we can see how even within our own church, there can be people who don't believe in Jesus. And it can happen and it can lead people astray. So John is trying to warn the people to be aware, not necessarily to be suspicious, but just to be aware that it can happen. And I don't think we imagine ourselves having spiritual adversaries today. And I think that can be very problematic. Because if we don't think we have any, and we don't expect it, we won't be ready for it when it does occur. And when we revisit the idea of the Antichrist being meant instead of Christ or in place of Christ, we can see how this happens in ways today. We sometimes think new is better, but every time something new comes out, we must also look at the risks and challenges and changes it will cause. Think about new things we have had throughout time. We went from candles to electricity. We went from horses for transportation to cars. And today we see people wanting to go from Christ to some new age philosophy, replacing the need for Christ with some new spiritual guru claiming to have the truth. Now, not all new things are bad. I think electricity and automobiles have helped our society in many ways, though they do have their own challenges. But there is no replacement for Christ. As Callie said, he is the greatest of all time. Some will try to replace Christ still, but we must remember there is no replacement. And furthermore, when we view these adversaries or these antichrists in terms of opposing Christ, we might think of things incredibly evil or visibly different. But when we think of it with the idea of instead of Christ, maybe that will change our perception because these people can seem wonderful, like a savior and charming, and we could be drawn to them, but we must be weary let, lest we let them replace Christ in our lives. It could also be seen in people who say, hey, Jesus was an awesome teacher, but he doesn't need to be God or people who spin rhetoric in such a way that causes us to believe things that are untrue or to doubt what we know. So John is writing this letter to remind them of what they do in fact know and that they have to hold on to their original beliefs and also trust that the Spirit will guide them in staying strong. Knowing that it can happen will help us to be prepared. Though I'll admit it can sometimes feel hard to constantly be prepared. But that is what we must do as Christians. Because there will always be an attack on our faith. These attacks can come in many ways. And one that John describes in his letters is people causing us to doubt Christ. Because of this, we must prepare. So imagine the things that you have prepared for. You prepare for trips, vacations, disasters. Now, I remember as a kid living in California, we would have to prepare for earthquakes. And I remember as a kid, we would have earthquake drills. And in elementary school, on the first, within the first week of school, 
we would have to bring in an earthquake kit. Now, a lot of you might be wondering what that is, because I mentioned to go to a friend, and they're like, I have no idea. But we would bring in these gallon Ziploc bags that had water, that had flashlights, that had batteries and Band-Aids and a little pack of, you know, the tuna crackers, uh, as well as a picture of your family and a note from a parent. And so I still remember what my mom had written in mine. She said, my huggy bear, which was my nickname, she said, you might be very frightened right now. I know there's a lot of scary things happening, but you have to listen to your teachers because they're trying to keep you safe and will come and get you soon. So just giving me the encouragement I needed to overcome that obstacle. And so here, obviously, we don't have to maybe prepare for earthquakes, but we do have to prepare our cars for the winter, for blizzards and possible spin-outs in the ditch. We stock them with blankets, snacks, a shovel, and whatever else will help us survive a night. We know preparing for these challenges is essential. And so that is why John is writing this letter. He's encouraging them, supporting them, strengthening them in what they know to be true. So after warning them of these potential dangers that they face in their spiritual lives, he gives them this reminder to help strengthen them. He reminds them that they have known the truth from the beginning. He reminds them to hold fast to the belief that they know that Jesus is the Son of God. They don't have to start following some New Age philosophy or some new guru that comes out with the latest spiritual trend. They know the truth from the beginning. And then he reminds them that they have been anointed with the Holy Spirit, assuring them that the Holy Spirit will continue to guide them, will continue to help them discern falsehood from the truth, and that the Holy Spirit will teach them. He urges them to stay with their foundation and not to leave it for quicksand. We, too, have a strong foundation, and we, too, have been anointed with the Holy Spirit. John's letter is just as applicable for us today as it was for the people back then. And if we look back to verse 22, we must respond to this belief that, yes, we believe Jesus is the Son of God. That is what we need to hold on to when we see and hear things happening around us, when people try to share a new form of spirituality or a new form of Christianity, or even people who try to suggest the irrelevance of God in today's modern world. John is asking us to remember our foundation and to stay strong in Christ. Because only in Christ as our foundation can we stand against the chaos that the last hour brings. So in the same way that we'd prepare our cars for winter and that we prepare for any other disaster that might come, let us prepare ourselves. Let us prepare ourselves staying strong and abiding in Christ with the assurance that the Holy Spirit will help us persevere whatever may come our way. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for coming down to us and for saving us. Thank you for the truth that you have given us. Thank you for your son, Jesus, who we proclaim as Christ and Lord and Savior. And so God, just be with us now as we continue to worship you and help us to remember your truth and that we are anointed with your Holy Spirit who will always guide us. Amen. And now let us stand for our closing hymn, We Are God's People, number 547.
the benediction, you are invited into the fellowship hall for uh, donuts and coffee and uh, just gathering together. And so let us now hear the benediction. May we go forth in the power, peace, and protection of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.